Right, so thank you very much for the invitation to come here. Uh, it's been a long time and uh, it's just as beautiful as before. And uh, I'm looking forward to giving these lectures. The plan is uh, to start slowly with an introduction to mean curvature flow, develop the equations, develop um, some regularity theory for mean curvature flow. And then in my part of the course, I will uh, focus on uh, monotonicity formula and some recent results on non-collapsing of uh, surfaces and uh, what you can do with it. Okay, so I start with the uh, setup of the problem. We want to consider uh, <coughs> immersions, smooth immersions of a hypersurface into some smooth Riemannian manifold. So here this is a smooth Riemannian manifold and uh, let's assume we are in the situation where there is no boundary and here this is a hypersurface immersion and uh, the picture you should have in mind is that there is uh, this uh, manifold Mn and you have this map F into this uh, Riemannian manifold and here you have the image of the hypersurface, the image of the manifold sitting in here as a hypersurface and this is uh, Nn plus 1 and uh, <coughs> in here you have the uh, image F of Mn. And uh, now <coughs> it's important to consider the geometric structures that you have on this thing. The first thing you have to take into account is the induced metric on the hypersurface. This is uh, G uh, is just the restriction of G bar to the tangent space of the uh, hypersurfaces. And if we have here some coordinate map x into Euclidean space Rn, and we have <coughs> some uh, coordinate maps here on a point f of p. So here's p, here's f of p, and we have some coordinate map into Rn plus 1. Let's call it y then you can compute the coefficients of the induced matrix at the point P to be <coughs> the inner product of the tangent vectors <coughs> of F with respect, so these are the derivatives with respect to X, and you take the G bar metric in formula. This is, uh, to be absolutely precise, <coughs> G bar alpha beta at f of p times df alpha dxi and uh, df beta uh, dxj at uh, <coughs> p. And here uh, the indices by convention I use the i and j run between 1 and n and the <coughs> alpha beta, the Greek indices, refer to the target manifold and they run from 0 to n. So this is the first structure you have to take into account. The second structure that is important, you have to pick a unit normal. And uh, if I have a closed surface <coughs> in, say, Euclidean space, I always pick the outward unit normal. Sometimes in the Riemannian manifold, might not be clear what the outward normal is, so you have to say what unit normal you mean. And once you have the unit normal, you can uh, compute the second fundamental form. And the second fundamental form, this is a bilinear map at each point on the tangent space. <coughs> uh, which <coughs> I 
uh, which has, is represented by a matrix at each point, which I denote by Hij at P, again Ij between 1 and n, and then the Hij's <coughs> can be computed from the second derivatives if I have such a representation, I have that the Hij at P with a minus sign times the alphas component of the unit normal, P, is computed by the second derivatives of F. So this would be the coordinate representation. And here you have the Christoffel symbols. I assume here you know what that is, the, the <coughs> Kij <coughs> uh, times the F dxj, dxk, and then there's an extra term coming from the target manifold, you, the Christoffel symbols of the target manifold alpha, gamma k, gamma <coughs> rho, say, times uh, df, gamma dxi, df uh, rho dxj. So, <coughs> um, if you want to describe this um, more um, more uh, abstractly, and if you said, say, if you have a tangent vector field EI, so in this setting, this would be <coughs> the uh, <coughs> uh, the F D X I. So, <coughs> but more abstractly, you can say that the second fundamental form components are given by the covariant derivative of the unit normal with respect to the ambient metric in direction Ej, which um, alternatively is uh, minus the normal of times um, the covariant derivative of Ej with respect to Ei. So this is a more uh, invariant way of writing it, but sometimes it's extremely important to have this uh, coordinate representation. And once you have the second fundamental form uh, in this way, it is important to realize that this is, of course, associated also with a mapping. So this is associated with the Weingarten map. Let's call it W at P, which is a map from the tangent space to itself. And <coughs> it's defined by the fact that WP applied to some x <coughs> multiplied with y with respect to the metric g is the same as a of p applied to x and y. And uh, this uh, Weingarten map then has components which I denote by h upper ij at p where the h upper ij are given by the h lower ij <coughs> by raising them with the metric g, and this, these are the components of the inverse metric. And now, because this hij here is symmetric, this w is self-adjoint, therefore, it has real eigenvalues, and these eigenvalues are the principal curvatures. Lambda 1 up to lambda n are the uh, principal curvatures. Of the hypersurface. And uh, now you can form all sorts of scalar invariants by taking homogeneous polynomials of these principal curvatures. For example, the product of lambda 1 and lambda 2 for a two-dimensional surface in R3 is the famous Gauss curvature. And we are mostly interested in the mean curvature, which is the sum. So the mean curvature h is just the sum of these principal curvatures, which in our setting, we can now also write as the trace of W, which is uh, H 
I I, sum over I, my notation, or it is the trace with respect to G of the second fundamental form. In other words, we can also take the inverse of the metric G I J and sum over I and J times lower I J. Okay? <coughs> and uh, now, when you look at this formula, the mean curvature seems to be something like a trace of second derivative, so you want to see that this is an elliptic operator, <coughs> but it somehow depends on the choice of the unit normal. So the really invariant thing is the mean curvature vector. The important object is the mean curvature vector, h vector. This is, you see here, if this is supposed to be elliptic, we have to take the trace of minus h, so this is minus h times nu. And see, if I change nu, the sign of this, so this vector is obviously invariant of, independent of the choice of nu. So independent of choice of nu. And uh, it can be written as an elliptic operator, g upper ij, of uh, the Hessen, Hessen of f minus Christoffel symbols, df dx k, and then we have this nonlinear term. Um, yeah, dot alpha beta df alpha dx i df beta dx j. And uh, this is uh, often called the Laplace Beltrami operator with respect to the metric G and the metric G bar. You see, this is. If we are just in Euclidean space, this is just the Laplace Beltrami operator <coughs> with respect to the metric G, but we have to also take into account this of this, of F. And uh, <coughs> to see the. So now we are ready to define what mean curvature flow is. So now <coughs> we say that a smooth family <coughs> F of hypersurfaces, so now we add a time parameter into this target manifold, is a solution of mean curvature flow. If the time derivative at each point and time is exactly this mean curvature vector. Okay? Let's call this mean curvature. This is the problem we want to study. And now, <coughs> because this operator here is, depends on the second derivatives. <coughs> the uh, uh, question is, is this really like a heat equation? And it turns out to have, you have to be a little bit careful because um, notice, we have still some room, yeah. Notice that the uh, Christoffel symbols here these Christoffel symbols, G, K, I, J, just a little, check this, do, do, do a little calculation. Turns out this is just G upper K, L times the second derivatives of F with respect to X, I, X, J times DF, DX, L. In other words, the 
Christoffel symbols here are the tangential parts of that vector there. So this is not capturing all the second derivatives of f. It's only taking the normal component. So this is like gij of the normal component of the second derivatives. And this is a lower order term, right? Plus, it's called this gamma bar of df, df. So <coughs> is this, this is not what you would call a uniformly elliptic operator that you can immediately apply elliptic theory to. It's uh, <coughs> the system of equations here. It's quasi-linear because it's linear in the second derivatives. It's quasi-linear, not linear because it is non-linear here. But it's also not um, elliptic in the tangential directions. And that's clear because it's a um, geometric flow which is invariant under uh, tangential transformations of our coordinate systems x or y. So there is an invariance in tangential directions. So it will not be um, uh, directly elliptic. A physicist, we have a physics institute here, would say there is a gauge group, and that's the tangential diffeomorphisms. Okay. <coughs> Invariant under tangential diffeos. So you have to be careful. Okay. Now, the uh, other, uh, now I, I think, yeah, I should give you a first example of mean curvature flow, right? It's, so far there has only been, been formulas. The main, the main example, of course, that you should think of if you have a closed surface, if the manifold, say, is Sn, and the embedding of the initial surface the, of F, Mn is equal to a sphere of radius R0 in Rn plus 1, in that case, this uh, <coughs> uh, equation here for the <coughs> uh, position of the surface becomes just a equation for the radius because uh, clearly this is uh, radially symmetric. So I just have to see what happens to this radius. And uh, <coughs> if you look at this, it must be true that the DDT of the radius at time t is equal to minus uh, h times nu, the outward normal. So it's shrinking, and the mean curvature is uh, <coughs> the uh, sum of the principal curvatures. Each principal curvature is 1 over r for the sphere. So we get this ODE, and therefore the <coughs> surface at time t is the sphere with radius r of t, and r of t can be computed explicitly. It's just the square root of r0 squared minus 2n times t. And therefore, this exists on a time interval up to r0 squared over 2n. So you have a finite time <coughs> when this thing shrinks rotationally symmetric to a point. And uh, this is very different from what some of you may have seen in the harmonic map heat flow. In the harmonic map heat flow, you would solve a equation ddt of f equals also Laplace Beltrami operator of f, but you would do it with respect to a fixed metric. Whereas here, our metric, g, is moving in time. And that's why it accelerates for the harmonic map heat flow. If you always use the initial metric on the, say, the standard sphere, it would also shrink, but it would sh shrink more and more slowly. It would take infinite time until it, the map reaches the central point. So there's a big difference between harmonic map heat flow and inverse mean, uh, and mean curvature flow already in this example. The uh, second example is obvious from this one, namely that you can take cylinders, right? You can take Mn of t to be a 
sphere of dimension n minus k with a certain radius cross rk. And here, then, r of t is equal to the initial radius squared, square root of this minus 2 n minus k times t. And you get this picture here, where you have an Sn minus k, and then here you have Rk. So we have immediately from this compact example, you get a non-compact example as well. The third thing is, of course, that any minimal surface is a stationary point. Any minimal surface is a stationary point. So <clears throat> the minimal surfaces are the fixed point of the flow. And uh, like an equator in a sphere would not move. And uh, this gives you the hope that maybe this uh, <clears throat> equation generalizes the minimal surface equation just like the um, ordinary heat equation generalizes Laplace's equation. The fourth example that is important is um, suppose your surface is a graph. Suppose it's not a closed surface, it's just a graph. The case of graphs Um, <clears throat> consider a function u on some domain in Rn cross some time interval into R and uh, <clears throat> uh, set, set mn of t to be the graph of u contained in Rn plus 1. And suppose that u satisfies the following PDE. DDT of u at xt is equal to the square root of 1 plus du squared times di, di u, sum over i, square root 1 plus du squared in omega across time interval. Now, if you're in this situation that you have a graph, then somewhere here is omega. Here you have this graph of u. Then <coughs> it turns out the, <coughs> so the motion here I'm describing is a motion in direction of the xn plus 1 direction. Now, for such a graph, uh, <coughs> let's take the lower unit normal nu, and then this normal is equal to, um, in terms of uh, u, you can easily compute, um, well, it has to be, <coughs> um, it has to be, it has to point down, so you get a minus one here, and it has to be, normal to the uh, tangent vector, so you get the gradient of u in the first n variables, and then here to make this length 1, you have to take 1 on the square root of 1 plus du squared to normalize it, so this is the lower normal to the surface, and the mean curvature, of course, is the divergence of the unit normal, and if you compare this, the mean curvature is just what's coming up in this formula. This is the mean curvature of a graph. And then if you compare this to our parameterization, so you take fx of t to be um, x comma u of x of comma t in Rn plus 1, and then you check here what is ddt of f, and then you see that ddt of f, when you take this vector and you multiply it with the unit normal, 
that you get exactly uh, multiply, so you so you get the uh, uh, vector zero um, square root one plus du squared uh, times h multiplied with the vector uh, du and then here minus one over square root one plus du squared and you see this there's a cancellation this is exactly minus h so the normal component of DDTF is equal to the mean curvature so up to tangential diffeomorphism this the solution here, up to the graph of u, up to differential, up to di tangential diffeomorphisms, is a solution of mean curvature flow. So solves mean curvature flow up to tangential diffeos. So that's an important equation, and it shows you that, in some sense. Since you can write any surface locally, like a graph, at least for a short time if it is smooth, this complicated system of equations can at least locally be seen as a solution of a scalar partial differential equation which has this typical quasi-linear type. Okay. Now, we have the examples. Now, of course, we want to know what happens to the flow more generally. We want to see how the shape of a given initial surface in this very general setting, how does the shape of the surface evolve as time goes on? Now, <coughs> you may ask, uh, what about, can, can you solve it at all? So there's the question of short time existence. And there's the question of what happens in the long run. Let us first concentrate for a moment on getting some more information on this equation before I talk about short time existence. So let's see what we can infer from this basic evolution equation here. This is the start, this is the equation. What more information can I get? So in particular here, here I only get told <coughs> how the position changes. Let's compute from that how does the metric change, how does the unit normal change, how does the second fundamental form change. Then we have more information and this will help us also to solve the existence problem. <coughs> there any questions up to here concerning my notation? Okay. Okay, so the next step is to compute evolution equations. And <coughs> so the first one, um, let, me, let me just state them first and um, then prove some of them. So I, let's follow this order here. The, structure here, the DDT of the induced metric turns out to be <coughs> uh, minus two times the mean curvature times the second fundamental form. Then turns out DDT of the volume element turns out to be minus mean curvature squared times the volume element. Thirdly, we can compute the DDT of the unit normal is just the tangential gradient of the mean curvature. Then fourthly, we compute that DDT of the second fundamental form turns out to be the Hessian of the mean curvature minus um, the mean curvature times 
the square of the second fundamental form plus a term that comes from the ambient curvature, so the Riemann tensor in the target manifold, and the zero here means the normal direction to the hypersurface. And uh, this, of course, <coughs> corresponds to an equation for the um, Weingarten map. So we can lift one index, and since the inverse metric also depends on time, uh, <coughs> this will lead to something like this. And uh, so I, I write it here so, so that you can sort of write in your notebook that you have all the important equations sort of in, in one view. Now, turns out that one can change, write equation four in slightly different form, namely you get the DDT of HIJ can be written as, in the Euclidean case at least, as Laplacian of HIJ, I, don't, I spare you the formula in a Riemannian manifold, which is very complicated, but in the Euclidean <coughs> setting, <coughs> you get um, DDT HIJ um, plus mi minus 2H HIL HLJ plus um, A squared times the second fundamental form, and the A squared is the sum of the squares of the principal curvatures. And also five bar, in, so this is in Rn plus one. The, these last two formulas are not in the Riemannian manifold, but in Rn plus one. And you get DDT of H upper Ij is uh, Laplacian for H upper Ij plus A squared times H upper Ij. Okay? This, this is a sort of the first, the crucial set of, um, this, this is going to be our toolbox, because uh, this, this is, these equations now tell us how all the interesting geometric quantities along the flow change, right? The metric, the normal, the second fundamental form, the Weingarten map. Once you know these formulas, you can compute everything else. Right, so let, let me sketch the proof of a few of them. So let's, let's, for example, do the first one, DDT of GIJ. Well, you <coughs> go into this equation. You have to solve this equation. Now, here's an important trick, how to do these computations. A very, very important trick. I said the equations are all invariant under diffeomorphisms. So we are completely free at any given point in time where we do the computation to choose our coordinate system cleverly. And you see, there's all these Christoffel symbols floating around. So it's clever to choose at a point where you do the computation, coordinate system, normal coordinate system, where these Christoffel symbols vanish. Then you can ignore all the terms where these Christoffel symbols appear except when you have to differentiate them. The different der derivatives of the Christoffel symbols, of course, do not vanish, but the Christoffel sim systems, uh, symbols themselves vanish. So, and also the first derivatives of the metric. So when I do the computation here, I'm allowed to ignore the first derivative of G bar if I'm sitting in normal coordinates, okay? So I choose a coordinate system where the first derivatives of G bar are zero, 
And then I get here DDT of GIJ is just in such a coordinate system, it's just DDXI of DDT of F, and DDT of F, I insert my equation H times nu, DF DXJ, and the other term is um, DF DXI times DDXJ of minus H times nu in a product with respect to G bar. And now, if I differentiate H, I get a normal vector times a tangent vector is zero, so I only have to differentiate <coughs> the normal. And here I get minus H times uh, D F D X J D D X I the normal. And now, but this term here is just the second fundamental form. And similarly here, in fact, it's the same term because the second fundamental form is symmetric. So I get this equation. And now I argue, OK, I only computed this in one coordinate system. But what I got in the end is a tensor. So since it's true in one coordinate system, this tensor equation must be true in any coordinate system. That justifies this first equation, OK? You see, here, this is a coordinate derivative with respect to nu. <coughs> this is not quite uh, the covariant derivative, but this, the difference would just be a Christoffel symbol, which is zero. So I saved myself in the, with this trick writing down all the Christoffel symbols. Okay. Now, <coughs> this is well established how to, how to do this. Um, I just wanted to show you this trick. Once you have this, um, <coughs> you can compute, of course, DDT of the determinant of the metric, since d mu is square root of the determinant of g times dx, so this evolution equation implies immediately this. To compute three, this was one, to compute three, the trick you have to use is that the uh, ddt of the normal times the normal, because it has length one, this is of course zero, so you can write DDT of the normal um, just as the, it will only have tangential components, right? The normal component will be zero. So you can write this as DDT of nu times the tangential component of the metric. So you can write it like this because DDT of the normal times the normal is zero, so you just have this guy. And then using the fact that the normal is vertical to the tangent director, you can flip this to the other side with a minus sign, and then you bring in, again, the time derivative of f, and that brings in h, and that gives you this formula. Uh, it's easy, yes, easy exercise. Which one? Here? Here? No, but if I differentiate h, if I differentiate h, then I'm left with the normal vector oh. times the tangent vector. So 
uh, right. And so you use also that DDT of nu df dxi is identically zero. And then you get the result. So that is, uh, that is three. Now to compute four, um, you go into this formula here. That's why I wrote, why I wrote it down, right? So, so to compute four, <coughs> compute DDT of HIJ is equal to DDT of <coughs> the inner product of uh, minus uh, D2F dxi dxj times nu. Uh, and uh, this term here, when you, when you multiply it with nu, is zero. So I can ignore this term. But I cannot ignore this term. So you get minus, uh, so, so you get this term here plus um, gamma bar of df df times nu. And uh, when you do this computation here, you again do the trick I told you about. For example, it looks horrible that you have to compute this. But here you don't have to differentiate df because this is 0. Don't have to differentiate that. Don't have to differentiate that. You just differentiate gamma bar. And the gamma bar term leads to the curvature term. So this is, that leads to this term and the equation. And in here, you use the evolution equation for f, and you use the evolution equation for nu, and then somewhere in there, when you do the computation, you also have to use the other Weingarten equation, which I didn't write, so you have to use that d nu dxi can be written as, uh, at places where the Christoffel symbols vanish, as HIL, G, L, M, sum of L and M, DF, DX, M. Plus terms. Yeah, oh no, okay, it's a term, because you have to, you have to be careful here. Plus, there's a term, gamma bar, uh, uh, alpha, 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 uh, beta, gamma, d, f, uh, beta, d, x, i, and there is a nu gamma, something like this. So if you use this, then you get two terms from differentiating these cross stoffel symbols. They combine to give that. And uh, then you use once more this formula here. I think it's a good exercise to see. And anyway, it's explained in the literature exercise uh, to check that you end up with this formula. And to get five, you just note that the time derivative of the inverse of the second fundamental form, the, the inverse of the metric, is minus you know, ddt of 1 over u is minus 1 over u squared d, dt of u. So it's minus the inverse of the metric times the inverse of the metric times the derivative of the metric. This is a general formula for the inverse of a metric. If you use that and you combine it with this evolution equation to raise the index, then you can easily pass from here to there and the minus sign switches because of this term here. Right, so this is equal to plus 2h h upper i j and explains this equation. Now, to, to move from equation 4 to equation 4 bar, um, one uses an important identity 
of differential geometry, it's the so-called Simon's identity, which occurs in many other contexts, so it's a crucial tool. That's why I think it's important I mention it here. <clears throat> so for four bar, we have to use Simon's identity. Simon's identity is a commutator identity. It tells you that you can compute the Laplacian of the uh, second fundamental form. In other words, the trace of the second derivatives can be computed from the second derivative of the trace. Right? The trace of the second derivatives is the same as the second derivatives of the trace, except for some commutator terms. And these commutator terms you have to compute using the Gauss equations and the Kodatsi equations, and they look like this. And then if you just stay in Euclidean space, this is, it's much more complicated in a general ambient manifold, but in Euclidean space it's that, and then you just insert this here, and you get, and you get this equation. And then <coughs> uh, raising the indices, you also get five bar. Okay, this uh, completes the proof. As an immediate corollary, we get an evolution equation for the mean curvature, which is important because mean curvature is the speed. We want to know how the speed changes. And uh, well, we just take the trace of equation five, right? We just have to take the trace of equation five and we see that the evolution equation of the mean curvature is the Laplacian of the mean curvature plus the mean curvature times the second fundamental form squared plus the trace of that Riemann term. But the trace of the Riemann term is exactly the Ricci tensor. You may say the Ricci tensor would be the trace over all indices, but if I, the only indice I'm missing if I take the G trace is the one with zero. But if you have two zeros next to each other because of the antisymmetries in the Riemann tensor, it doesn't contribute. So you get here the Ricci tensor in direction of the normal of the three manifold, of the manifold. And this is uh, not surprising. Let's stare now at our equations. This first equation here is just what you know from the first variation formula, right? This is just the first variation formula of a mini first variation of the area. If you move a surface with speed f, then the change of the volume, the surface volume, is f times mean curvature. Now our speed is mean curvature, so we get mean curvature squared. And if you have a minimal surface and you compute the second variation, then you get exactly this operator. And that's because uh, now our speed is the mean curvature and we compute the change of the speed. It's just like the second variation formula applied to H. Second variation <coughs> operator applied to the speed h. Okay. Now, if you are on a, um, what else can we learn? Uh, let's see what we can learn in the compact case from, from these equations, sort of quick, quick conclusions. Suppose our hypersurface mn is a closed hypersurface. Then a quick conclusion is, of course, <coughs> that uh, DDT of the total area of the surface is a minus h squared dmu, just from this equation here. So it's always decreasing. And in fact, this is, by the Hölder's inequality, this is decreasing faster than 
the decrease under n for, for some other speed f, the decrease would be like this. And if <coughs> the f has the same L2 norm than our speed, then by Hölder's inequality, this one would be larger. So it's the fastest decrease of area that you can arrange with respect to the L2 norm. So this is why sometimes mean curvature flow is called the gradient flow with respect to the L2 norm. Um, the other thing you can see immediately, <coughs> so the first observation is this. The second observation is um, by the maximum principle for scalar functions, if you start with positive mean curvature, it remains positive mean curvature. So if mean curvature is greater or equal to zero at t equals zero, this remains. And the strong maximum principle says it has to be, in fact, strictly positive later unless it was already zero. <coughs> Must have h greater than zero for positive t unless h <coughs> identically zero at t equals zero. That's the maximum principle, and Carlo will tell you more about the maximum principle and how you can invariant properties of the flow. So, but that's something easy you can just read off from the equation. Okay. Now, one thing I'm go not going to prove is the following. I refer to PDE theory that you can solve e this equation for a short time if you have smooth initial data. So, <coughs> without detailed proof, theorem, if f0 mn into nn plus 1 g bar <coughs> is a closed smooth hypersurface immersion, Closed means no boundary, compact in, say, C2 alpha. Then there exists <coughs> a unique solution of mean curvature flow on some short time interval. It might be long, but I only claim there is a solution on some short time interval. Yes? No, 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 no. Uh, this, this is if we, this equation I wrote down, if our speed is h. Ah, if the speed is h. If the speed is h. And then, of course, the second variation on the minimal surface is also zero because it doesn't move. Okay. Yeah. So the general one would be the. So the general one, it would be, uh, would be applied to some f, right? If, 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 yeah, if, if you have a minimal surface and you do the vari second variation in f, you get. Um, DDT of the mean curvature is Laplace in F plus F times A squared. Yes? Is it possible when we have H non positive less than zero? Oh, you, if, if you flip the sign of your unit normal, then H would be zero everywhere, right? If you, you, the sign of H itself 
is, <coughs> is depends on your choice of unit normal. So when I say h is greater or equal to zero, this is equivalent to h less or equal to zero, um, but with respect to the other normal. Depends on your choice. Yeah. So the, the real question is, does it have a sign? Yeah. I'm, I'm only talking about orientable surfaces here. Yeah. So, so the, difficult, the more difficult surfaces are, we'll, we will find out later, the more, most difficult surfaces are where H changes its sign inside the surface. Yeah. But um, a particularly nice class of surfaces is the surfaces that have positive mean curvature because then we have much more information. They always flow in the same direction. That makes them much more stable, allows much fewer singularities, as we will see. So in later, I will prove a lot of nice theorems for surfaces of positive mean curvature that I cannot prove for general surfaces. Not necessarily. No, not necessarily. No, it could be Rn plus 1 in particular. Yeah. Oh, that, that's a completely different story. I, I said at the beginning the ambient manifold is Riemannian. If the ambient manifold is a Lorentzian manifold, then it's a completely different story because then this sum of what I said would apply if you have a space like hypersurface. But even then, some of the signs will be different from the Riemannian case. Yeah? But it's a completely different story. So um, I have to concentrate on some things in this course. Yeah, so. Right. So uh, I guess I'm running out of time. I, sh I think I should stop at 11.30. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, let me just state the uh, <coughs> just make make yeah maybe maybe take uh, two comments on this proof. The proof is using um, there's two ways to prove this. Either abstractly you go for the uh, uh, system, and then you have these tangential diffeomorphisms, so when you linearize, you have a kernel, and you have, find, have to find the integrability condition to deal with this kernel. There is an abstract way of doing that, very elegant, but you know, you, uses a huge amount of machinery. More down to earth would be to write the surface as a graph <coughs> over the initial surface, and then you can reduce it to a scalar equation, just a, like I showed you, you can reduce it to a scalar equation in R and plus one. Then you have a scalar quasi-linear PDE, and that's what you can solve by linearization using the implicit function theorem. So it's not that hard to get this theorem, and it uses standard PDE techniques, so that's why I don't give this proof. What I want to prove next time, and that's related to regularity estimates, is I want to show that you can extend this short time solution until the curvature blows up. So the next time I prove the following theorem, and I close here with this, <coughs> for each smooth initial data, <coughs> the solution exists on a maximal time interval. zero t max, where this maximal time interval is certainly non-empty. It may go to all the way to infinity, but if it does not extend to infinity, if the, we cannot extend the solution further, then the <coughs> soup of the second fundamental form on the surface m and t becomes unbounded as t approaches t max. In other words, we can detect when there's a problem by just looking at the curvature. And that's what I'm going to prove next time uh, together with regularity estimates for the flow. Thank you. <laughs>